Well, good morning, and thank you for that lovely introduction. It's very, very kind, but I have to say it's a privilege to be here talking to you at what I think is a critical time for people involved in the work of the family, children, safeguarding, and so on. And it's a critical time, but I think it can also be somewhat overwhelming. We've heard some of the things that have been going on. So we have parents in Wales who are, you know, desperately tearing their hair out about some of the uh, sex education con content being uh, provided to their children or being proposed by the Welsh Government. We've got the same in Scotland. We've got Northern Ireland as well, where there are proposals going on. We've heard about the uh, family sex show for, uh, aimed at, uh, at, at five-year-olds. Every day there's a new initiative, something new. And I think it's sometimes hard, because what we're told so often is that, well, what are you worrying about? This is just about providing information to children. And children need information, and of course they do. And it's age appropriate. And it's backed by evidence. And the evidence suggests that if you don't take the, the sort of approach we're suggesting, then um, your children are going to be at risk, safeguarding, or they're not going to develop sexually or, or emotionally. And it's hard when you're faced with those sorts of attitudes. And if you don't believe what we say, then, of course, you're a bigot. If you don't like the idea of uh, five-year-olds um, being presented with information about sex by men or women who are, who are naked, then you're a bigot. So we have to take a step back and think, well, how best do we tackle these issues and how best do we present ourselves and present uh, a, a rational, sensible, logical alternative view? So, of course, Debates about sex education in schools are not just about providing essential information in schools. We all know that. It doesn't take much analysis to get through that. It's much more involved. It's about what content is covered, what age, what material is used, what language is presented to children. And always there's this integral, we talk about sex education, what slides in with this is services. And not just services, but confidential services to children which is, you know, people think of sex education as about information, but this is part of official advice on what sex education in schools should be. What do we mean by confidential? Well, another, another word might be secret. In other words, that um, access to abortion and contraception, sometimes in school directly, sometimes uh, being signposted and linked to other services, including for under-16s, but without parental knowledge or consent. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. We have the, you know, the Gillick um, or Fraser guidance as to when th this should apply. But uh, the general approach of official sex education programmes is that this should be standard. OK, let's put the morals, the ethics to one side. Easy for me to do. I'm an economist. We don't have any morals. We don't have any ethics. Uh, we know nothing about love or anything like that. Um, and... Uh, you know, I, th I think there is a, there is a place for, for us sometimes. We, we get a hard time, don't we? For, we blame for everything, e economists. And uh, people are sometimes surprised that economists, you know, look at uh, sex education, abortion. Actually, there's a long tradition of economists looking at uh, the, the family, but tending to be from not a what is right and wrong, but what happens if you do this, what is the consequence? What does the data say? And, and of course, we might have big disagreements on what's right and wrong and what should be done, but hopefully we can be a bit objective about what the evidence says does happen or is the case. So is school-based sex education effective? What's the evidence for mandatory? In other words, laws that say schools have to do sex education or primary schools have to or have to follow a particular course. What about safeguarding? So that's some of the issues which I'm going to talk about, uh, talk about today. Um, so let's start with that first one. Is school-based sex and relationships education effective? And this is a huge topic. You look at the literature and the peer-reviewed literature, there are thousands and thousands of studies. So it's not too hard, if you want, to pick out a particular story. If you, anyone who's worked in academia, you know, there's, there's good studies, there's bad studies. And, and I have to say that's true on sort of both sides of the, of the equation, you know, coming out with different outcomes. So you have to be a little bit careful because it's easy to find, oh, this study finds... You know, sex education in increases early sexual activity. Oh, look, we're, you know, what we said in family education trust is right. But you've got to be careful. Right? One place I like to start is the Cochrane Systematic Reviews. And I don't know if you've heard, heard of these. These are considered the gold standard summary of evidence. So they focus on randomized controlled trial type approaches, which isn't the only way to look at evidence. So there's sort of population level studies, which can be very valuable, which they don't really cover. 
But the Cochrane systematic reviews look at RCTs across a whole range of sort of medical areas and social areas, and they focus not just on individual studies, but reviews of studies. So they're like a review of the best reviews, and they have really tight quality control for their, for their studies. So they're considered the gold standard of evidence. And I just want to mention two. There's two relatively recent. There's nothing in the last couple of years. So these are from 2016, but they're the most recent Cochrane reviews. One is by uh, uh, Orin Ganji um, and colleagues. A couple of the headlines. Educational interventions were unlikely to significantly delay initiation of sexual intercourse. We're often told sex education helps young people to delay sexual activity, doesn't have the effect that you, you know, of sort of hastening it. Well, actually, the evidence isn't there. No, it doesn't. It's not clear if educational interventions had any effect on unintended pregnancy. So all this stuff about interventions, you know, um, sex education, but also providing condoms in schools or the morning after pill or whatever it might be, not clear. There's another study which focuses more on pregnancies by Mason Jones. Educational programs evaluated had no demonstrable effect on the prevalence of HIV or other STIs. There was also no apparent effect on the number of young women who were pregnant. So from these official gold standard evidence reviews, the evidence is really saying nothing, no, no, no particular benefits. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing sex education. I'm just saying in terms of the evidence, whatever outcome you look at, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be much of a benefit. There's a slightly older but uh, a UK-focused one because the, the Cochrane reviews look across the world, and it's, sometimes it's interesting to focus on the UK. Um, th this review very similar, again looking at a range of studies, the programs had minimal effect on reported behaviour. Studies looking at pregnancy rates found no impact, no impact. Okay? There, there are also studies, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's some work which I've done that some, some of these interventions, so for example providing the morning after pill in schools, can lead to adverse outcomes. For example, they're associated with increase in sexually transmitted infections, which perhaps wouldn't be a surprise, but there is some evidence for that. And what about some more recent evidence? So sometimes people say, well, okay, but you, know, you can't look at sex education on its own. You've got to look at the whole gamut, the whole a range of interventions, and it's sort of a, you know, a, a, um, not just taking one in isolation. Okay? Well, actually, some of those Cochrane reviews do, do that. But there's a very nice study uh, by uh, Andrew Baxter uh, looking at the English teenage pregnancy strategy. We've seen a big reduction in teenage pregnancies in England, as we have in many countries across the world, since about 19, the late 1990s. And of course, around about the time actually it started after that decline started, we had the teenage pregnancy strategy, which saw a huge amount of resources going into sex education, sexual health services for young people, educational programs outside schools, the whole sort of gamut of interventions. What did they find? They found, although teenage pregnancies and births in England fell, okay, Comparisons with other countries, and they had a very fancy statistical methodology, it's a really nice paper, suggests the strategy had little, if any, effect on pregnancy rates. So this idea that, uh, you know, it, it's different if we just, okay, if you take one intervention, you don't find an effect, but you look at things together, you do. No, the evidence isn't there. Um, what about, that? I've sort of separated this out, that's looking at sex education programs themselves, the things people do, which can cover a whole range of interventions, actually. And, and you can go into detail, and of course, you can find better programs and programs that aren't so good, and some which may be slightly more effective than, than others. But what's often of interest from a policy point of view are laws that say you have to do a certain type of education in schools, or you have to, for example, have parental consent before you provide contraception to young people, or you have to have uh, sex education in primary schools, or you're not allowed to have sex education in primary schools. What happens with these sorts of laws? There's actually much less evidence on this, so I think we can be less sort of conclusive. I think when we're looking at sex education, we can say pretty much doesn't have much of an impact, certainly no benefit on, on any of the main outcomes we're interested in. It's a very broad brush to, to a huge amount of literature, but I think that's a reasonable conclusion. With mandates, there's much less evidence, so we, we have to be a bit more careful. But I wanted to say a little bit about a paper which um, I had published uh, fairly recently uh, with Stephen Bullivant from St Mary's and Juan Soto, a, a Spanish guy, looking at the impact of sex education mandates on teenage pregnancy, looking across the world. Okay? And this was published in a journal called Health Economics, which is a sort of you know, reasonably good e economics journal which often looks at these sorts of issues. And the context is, yes, we have seen fairly big drops in teenage pregnancy rates, 
across many countries in the developed world since the late 1990s. And there's been lots of discussion about why this might be. You know, some areas it's more focused than others. So Eastern Europe, a little bit different because, of course, you had the you know, transition from uh, you know, the communist states and probably changes in data collection and so on. But it's reasonably true, certainly in the Anglosphere. You look in New Zealand, uh, UK, Ireland, uh, Canada, big drops in, in teenage pregnancy rates. Lots of legal changes. So you've had countries that have introduced mandatory sex education like we've had in England from a couple of years ago. Some have changed their mandatory rules, mandatory SRE in primary schools, parental opt-outs. And it's, the data is quite nice, at least for us as economists, because you have countries dropping in and out. So you have, do have some changes in both directions. You have countries which have got rid of mandatory sex education, other, others that have introduced it, which makes it a really nice um, sort of experiment to look at the data. So what we did, we, look, we examined one aspect. So we examined pregnancy, birth, abortion rates, um, and looking, well, what happens before and after these legal changes? But we put it in a sort of e an econometric study, so a sort of big multivariate study where you look at lots of things going on at the same time. So you say, well, OK, a country changes its law. What happens relative to other countries that didn't change the law at that time? And of course, there's lots of things going on at particular time periods that might affect pregnancy rates. So you might have a recession or you might have you know, general society changes as people perhaps get less religious or whatever it might be, or fa changes to family breakups and so on. So we controlled for lots of those factors. You have sort of control for things that are going on across the globe, like a global recession at the same time. And you can control, of course, every country is different on, it, on its own. You know, some countries, uh, perhaps more traditional family oriented and tend to have quite much lower very early pregnancy rates, but we're interested in what happens before and after the legal changes and looking at the timing of that um, as, you know, that may have an effect on pregnancies at different ages. So I strongly encourage you to look at the study. There's lots of interesting statistics and equations in there. We're, we're economists, we love to uh, make, try and make ourselves look very clever by saying very uh, obvious and simple things, but using loads of uh, mathematical equations and so on. Just, uh, but r really, at heart, we, we tend to be stating the obvious, but hopefully in quite a careful and rigorous way at looking at looking at the evidence. So, I mean, genuinely, if people want to look at the paper, we're always interested in, you know, how you can improve things and, um, you know, comments people have on it. Uh, and by the by the way, I've got some references for the, some of the things I'm talking about, and there are some hard copies of the slides. Uh, I've got if people want to. Uh, you know, take away some or you can send me an email. I'm happy to, to share them. Um, so what do we find in the paper? Well, summarising without going through all the equations and so on, the, broadly, laws mandating sex education in schools, if anything, were associated with higher rates of teenage fertility. Okay? If anything. And, 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 you know, when you look at things statistically, there's all sorts of different ways of packaging the data and robustness tests. It was actually a reasonably robust result that there was, a, if anything, a small increase in teenage fertility. So they certainly didn't help to lower teenage pregnancy rates. Parental opt-out laws, though, on, in general, seem to be reasonably positive. If anything, they had some positive effects. Well, maybe that's not a surprise to people here, but you perhaps wouldn't believe that when you see, um, you know, official sex education guidance where the word parents um, is often uh, conspicuous by its absence. Um, but certainly what's true, changes to national laws were really, they weren't, the, they're not the driver of declines in teenage pregnancy rates across the globe. And actually, I think this is a, this is a common lesson. You know, those of you who've been following the, the COVID data, I think governments tend to overestimate the effect of what they do and their power to influence social trends whether it be a, a, you know, a, a pandemic as well, but certainly in terms of uh, teenage pregnancy and so on, you have to look much deeper for, what, for the drivers of these things that are going on. And that could be something we could talk about, about what really is going on with some of the declines, because I think that's quite an interesting story, but not, not, for, not for today. Um, so just sort of summarising that evidence, I'm going to talk about safeguarding in a second, but uh, I think it's uh, incontrovertible. This is not con controversial. There is no consistent evidence that school-based SRE mandatory sex education has any beneficial impact on sexual health outcomes. So you, if, if, if you see government guidance saying they may refer to a study, you can always find a study which has a slightly different point of view. But when you look at the gold standard evidence in the whole, okay, it is not there to support um, that these sort of measures improve outcomes for children. There's some, some, some aspects of what is called SRE, you may think it shouldn't be called SRE, but this sort of you know, access to the morning after pill type thing may have harms. 
And there's some evidence that involving parents is beneficial, and, that, and that's, again, a very broad brush, brush. There's some very interesting work in involving parents in abortion decisions in America, which tends to find uh, beneficial outcomes on a whole, whole range of things, but also in terms of sex education itself. So where does that leave us? What are the implications? Well, I want to be clear, this does not have to mean, or not necessarily mean, there isn't a role for sex education in schools. Okay. You may, we, I'm guessing probably here we have a range of views on what that should be. I think actually the evidence base is very liberating because what we're often told is you have to t take this sort of approach because otherwise your children will be at risk, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have adverse outcomes, your you know, daughters will get pregnant when they're age 13 or we don't want that to happen and it sort of you know, really hits at the heart of parents. No, the evidence isn't there that we have to do the sorts of programmes that governments push on schools for that reason. So there's not a case for a one-size-fits-all, mandatory, you know, early comprehensive sex education. I think this is what's more important. I think we should be focusing on what information do we want to present to children? What format? What age? That's a really... I'm, I'm not going to go into it. I'm not a sociologist, but, you know, that, that's where the interesting question is. And we should be free to discuss that. And I think schools should be free to um, discuss that with parents. And, and I'd give a little word of caution. I think earlier on um, you heard, well, you know, that perhaps a push to uh, regulate who schools are allowed to invite in. I suspect that if governments are regulating who schools are allowed to, to invite in, that will not end well for family groups. So I would be very, very cautious before going down that route, actually. I would be much more interested in saying transparency. You know, when, when, it, when things are brought out into the light, it's much easier for parents to influence what schools do. And actually, you're probably safer giving schools discretion with that proviso that they have to be clear and honest and transparent rather than the government allowing go the government to regulate who's allowed in because we know the type of people, well, I suspect we know the type of people who will end up being allowed in and who will be forbidden from going to schools if you go down that route. Um, so this, for me, is really crucial. Transparency and involving parents at every stage. But also for schools... Uh, don't be afraid to do less rather than uh, more, and later rather than earlier. Schools are worried because they're worried, oh, are, we, are we sort of cheating our children of, of things they need? Well, you know, if you're worried about a certain type of, uh, you know, something you're presenting to them, or you're worried, how will parents react? Probably you're better off being on the safe side. It's actually less risky. You're not going to risk adverse outcomes by doing things earlier and, you know, more explicitly or whatever it might be. So don't be afraid to do less rather than more. We'll talk a little bit more about that to those who come to the workshop. And I'm slightly uh, miffed that, I, that I've got to be at the workshop because I'd love to hear what uh, uh, Stella and James and, uh, and Calvin say in their workshop. But I, I suppose you can't, you can't do everything. So um, a few things just to watch out for in SRE schemes. So sort of pre preempting some of the things we'll, we'll talk about. Um, assumption of Gillick com competence. So schools often believe that this Gillick competence, in other words, that you, know, you can provide... Sec um, condoms or the morning after pill or access to abortion for under 16s without informing parents and of course that is the law that is the true and schools are allowed to do it but sometimes schools are given the impression that they have to do that and that is not true unless there's a lawyer here or tell me something different and it's true also for, for GPs and doctors you don't have to provide these things for, for, for children there may be certain pro protocols you have to follow so a school can quite right can quite justifiably have a policy saying we will not provide um, any form of artificial contraception or abortion to children under 16 or indeed to any child at the school um, completely. And we certainly won't do it if we don't inform parents. Okay, so be careful about that and how that's worded. Normalisation of underage sexual activity. I'm going to say a little bit more about this in a, in a second. Focus on consent. This idea of consent is so prevalent. And of course it's really, really important. I'm not saying consent isn't important. But it's treated as a sufficient condition in so many sex education schemes for even under 16s engaging in sexual activity. So if you heard this phrase, you know, only you can decide when you're ready to have sex. Only you can decide when you are ready. And it sounds, you know, the first you hear it, you can be taken by, in by it, can't you? You know, of course, consent's really important. You've got to rightly teach children that their body is their own body and so on. But only you can decide, well... So, you know, you can think a 13-year-old been going out with her, uh, her or his you know, boyfriend or girlfriend for three weeks. 
I'm really in love. They've told me, sex, you know, you should only do it within a really committed relationship. My boyfriend tells me he loves me, and all my other friends say they're having, having sex. Oh, I think I'm ready now. Yeah, you know, that is quite literally the implication when you see the wording of some of the sex education schemes. It's a really, really dangerous phrase. So consent in isolation, I think, is something you really have to look out for and, and focus on. It's not, of course, it's a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient condition for, uh, you know, giving the message to young people about when it's okay to start sexual activity. And I think there's also, I'm not going to say so much about the um, transgender issue because, you know, that's coming up, uh, for other people are more experts on that than me, but I think there's, across the whole spectrum of these things, you can mix up this desire to be non-judgmental, to be, give a welcoming environment, not to make people feel guilty, you know, all these things we want. We want children to, to grow up in a healthy environment where they feel safe, you know, a safe space. But you can mix that up with affirming choices and behaviour. And I think it's really important that schools and parents make a distinction between these sorts of things. When you're, when you're not wanting to judge individuals, quite rightly, but when you're also saying, well, actually, I'm not going to affirm this, or I'm not going to you know, necessarily go along with this choice you make. There's certain decisions we're going to make, and there's a difference there. Um, I want to say a little bit about the evidence regarding... Uh, regarding safeguarding, because I think it's connected. It's connected with uh, the, the sex education evidence. And um, th those of you here will know about the, got a copy of it here, uh, the, the book Unprotected, which the late, great Norman Wells authored. And I was really honoured uh, to, to write the foreword for, for, for this book. It's not because of that, but I actually think this book is a really important piece of work. Even now, I think it's scandalously uh, unrecognised. I think it's scandalous that no mainstream journalist that I'm aware of out there has taken the issues raised by Norman in this book and investigated them because it's ripe for a serious investigation. And I just want to highlight some of those things for you because, you know, we can be sort of caught up in the bubble of, um, you know, the family issues and a particular type of approach. With the evidence on sex education, our approach is actually mainstream. As, as we've seen, some of the evidence is, you know, reasonably supportive. It's the same with safeguarding. So what Norman looked at was looking at um, evidence from serious case reviews of where things had gone wrong in, with safeguarding. And lots of the focus in the press was on grooming gangs and the role of ethnicity and, and religion and all, all these sorts of things. I'm not saying that's not an important aspect, but Norman was focusing on something which never seemed to get discussed in the press reports on these grooming gang cases and uh, serious case reviews. So he was looking at fundamental flaws, so systematic flaws in professional attitudes, attitudes of social workers, teachers, school nurses, the police, towards underage sexual activity and how that directly contributed to, uh, to, to safeguarding problems and to abuse. But also a tendency to dismiss parental concerns. Is that still an issue now? We, we know it is. You dismiss parental concerns. And of course, parents, we know parents get things wrong. We know that. I'm a parent. A number of times I've got things wrong. But so do government, so do police, so do social workers, even with the best intentions. And unfortunately, there seems to be an assumption that act, actually it's parents who get things wrong more about their own children than some of the professional organisations. And that's a fundamental problem because, of course, the opposite is true on average. Um, and then we, we go back to this message again, the message that children are getting, they've got to be free to decide for themselves when they are ready. So we saw time and time again how the police or social workers would say, well, it was a consensual sexual relationship. Yes, but this was a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old and the boyfriend was, uh, you know, 30 or whatever it might be. But this idea of consent, time and time again, allowed that, that abuse to con continue. Just a, a, a couple of stories from the, uh, you know, from, 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 from the book. Here's one. Julia, obviously they're all, um, you know, uh, names have been changed, of course, in, in these serious case reviews. She was abused from the age of 12, but she went to the school nurse, and she was assessed as being Gillick competent. So what the response was to, to be given contraception. So, of course, what, what effect did that have? Well, it had the effect of perpetuating the abuse. When, uh, you know, a mother disclosed that her daughter had been raped, the GP pres prescribed contraception. It's a real, real problem. This isn't a one-off case. It happens time and time again. Child F. She was a vulnerable 15-year-old. She had special needs. She was, this is a, a case in Hampshire, and she was being sexually abused at school. But the school judged her to be engaging in consensual sexual activity because the partner was somebody of a similar age. They didn't tell her parents. 
So she's a child with special needs. They didn't tell her parents uh, and um, you know, provided sexual health advice. And of course, she carried on suffering that abuse for years. This, is, this hasn't ended. So, so Norman's case goes through, I think there's 10 or 11 serious case reviews. But there have been a number of serious case reviews published since then. One in Somerset, shortly after The Unprotected was published. This, is a, this was about perpetrators, so people have been found guilty later on. There was two children. There was a 15-year-old who was sexually active. She was self-harming. She was you know, in a clearly very damaged state. She became pregnant by a boyfriend who she said was 19 to 21. What happened? She had a termination. What happened after that? She had more serious mental health problems. And then later on, two of the children involved, so this child actually gave birth to, that, to one of the perpetrator's child. So the idea that arranging a termination, which I'm sure you know, the people doing it thought was in the best interest of the, of the child, that was actually a chance to intervene and stop the abuse. But no, they were deemed a sort of sexual activity, and this was, let's deal with this problem. The, the, uh, of course, the baby was aborted, and then the girl still got pregnant and had a, had a child. Okay? Tragic, tragic case. Uh, Newcastle Serious Case Review, I think, was particularly revealing. Because when they looked at the, this, is another big scandal up in, in Newcastle, they concluded that approximately 85% of the victims of sexual exploitation had received services from sexual health, be it at school or in the community. 85%. Okay? And this was their recommendation. They rec recommended the government should urgently arrange for the principle of supply to confidentially, confidentiality and safeguarding, in other words, the Gillick competence rulings, to be reviewed. Now we know more about sexual exploitation. This was their recommendation to the government. They're not the only serious, serious case review. Several of the serious case reviews have asked the government to look urgently at laws about that say you can't have sex with you under 16, but you can give children under 16 contraception without their parents knowing. They've explicitly stated as that as being a contributory factor to the, because it's an obvious contradiction, isn't it, to sexual abuse. So where is the action from the government on this? This isn't f some family campaigners calling for this. These are professionals who I guess have, you know, probably have fundamentally different, I have no idea, but you know, you'd imagine many of them would have fundamental differences to some of the views we might have on what's right and wrong. But in terms of safeguarding, where are the journalists who have looked into this and lobbied and, and written articles, in-depth articles, where are the MPs pushing for the government to do something about this? Okay? This, this is still going on, and it's not just going on, it's endemic. So here's just one quote from the Scottish scheme we've heard mentioned before. So this is uh, uh, from their third and fourth level, so looking at 11 to 15 year olds, and it's in the section they call human sexuality, sexuality and the, the idea of sexual rights. So right to personal autonomy, young people have the right to decide on matters about their sexuality, they are free to explore their sexuality in safe and pleasurable ways. So this is from a slide, so this isn't guidance to teachers, a slide designed to be shown in the classroom for 11 to 15 year olds. So if you're looking at this as an 11 to 15 year old, what message do you take? Do you take the me message that, well, really, you know, we're better off delaying sex until we're older and, to, and it's illegal and, you know, until you're over 16? They do mention the law later on in another slide, by the way. There's no mention of age here. There's no mention of young people have the right to decide at an appropriate age, even. You might have still have problems with that as a statement, but at least there'll be something there. The implication, again, is it's purely down to consent and age is irrelevant. And you see this type of messaging throughout these schemes in Wales, in Scotland, in um, uh, English schemes across, across the world. It's, a, it's sort of the standard approach. Okay? Another one you, you may be aware of, the Brook Traffic Light Guide. Have you, some of you perhaps heard of this. So Brook, you know, one of the primary organisations who provide contraception and so on to, to people under the age of 16. Often they work in schools or in community areas. They provided a traffic light guide to safeguarding. And this traffic light guide is very interesting. They had for different ages, when you know children are five to seven and so on. This is one for behaviours aged 13 to 17. So looking at 13 to 17 year olds. Um, as I said, I'm not worried about the. If you can't see the words, there's copies at the back, and I can send you this. So don't worry about uh, you know make, making notes of it. And they, they had green behaviour, amber behaviour, and red behaviour. Now this traffic light, as we'll see, got lots of criticism. Um, so they say Brooks say they've changed it, um, but what they've also done is hidden it behind a paywall. So no one can actually see what the new traffic light guide says. So maybe it's now absolutely fine and perfect for safeguarding. I'm sure we can completely trust them. 
Uh, but the fact that it's hidden um, does, it might, might give you slight pause for thought. But more than that, the original guide is still, if you look on the internet, it's used in many local authorities around the country. It's still published and it's used as their as a sort of go-to guide. Let me give you one example. So this is green behavior. With green behavior, it says, well, um, this is, it reflects safe and healthy sexual development. Okay? So this is an example of green behavior. Consenting oral or penetrative sex with others of the same or opposite gender who are of similar age and developmental ability. This is for 13 to 17 year olds. It's seen as safe and healthy behavior. What can you do? Give positive feedback. Okay? This is a, a document that was recommended at one point by the government as an official device. It's used right across the country. As I said, who knows how they've changed it? Don't know. They, they don't tell us. Positive feedback. All that matters is that there's not too big an age difference. If you're 13 and the other person's, what is a um, similar age? I don't know. You're 13 and the you know, boyfriend's 17. Is that a similar age? Perhaps not. I don't know. Um, but as long as you're, you know, similarly developmental ability, what does that mean? Then this is positive, safe and healthy behaviour. So let's be under no illusions about the sorts of things we're up about. It is easy to sort of go over the top and say, you know, all these terrible things are going on. This is real. And this is from a sort of recommended mainstream organisation. So um, where, where do we go with this? What, what do we do What we face with this? Well, I think where we go is to you. Because we're not going to get the government intervening as they should do and responding to uh, the Newcastle Safeguarding Board or to these um, things which you know, recognised organisations are going to put out there. They're not going to respond to it unless they see the pressure from parents from social workers, from teachers, from head teachers, from governors, from grandparents, from uncles, aunts, and indeed from children themselves, who do have the best interest of children at heart. In other words, you. And I think the most important thing I would say that, that I pick up from this is the importance of transparency, because time and time again, you see schools, not all schools, there's schools you know, trying to do a fantastic job, but some schools, People like Brooke, um, so the theatre groups, will not want to be honest about what is being shown. They won't want to, let, want to let people see it. And as soon as that happens, a red light should go up. Talking about red behaviour, that should be the red light. As soon as somebody is a bit cautious about parents, and they say, oh, if parents see this, they'll, they'll be up in arms and, they're, and they'll you know, we'll get lots of hassle. Well, does that not make you think, you know, you're a head teacher, you're in... Uh, local parentis looking after the, these children. Of course, we, you know, pa we can get parents who are a bit over, over the top or you know, not rational, but if you're really worried about parents seeing what you're going to show to their children, maybe you should be thinking, is this the right thing to do? So this is where it really, I think, things are effective. And, and, and of course, you can see what happens with the other side. So on the transgender debate, for example, why is it that they focus so much on targeting the individual person and cancelling people. You know, that's always a focus, isn't it? The focus is not about debating the issue. It's about focusing on the person who disagrees with them and labelling them in some way and saying that, othering them. And we've seen this for years in the family campaigns on issues to do with abortion or sex education. It's the same sort of approach. Okay? You don't want to associate with these horrible extremists. Why is that? Because if you focus on the debate... So you actually focus on, okay, so you know, we all want to be kind to people who have got gender identity problems, but we perhaps don't want a 15-year-old boy sharing a, a biological male sharing a dormitory with girls. Or we don't want um, adult biological male swimmers competing in women's races. Or whatever it might be. You know, these very common sense practical issues. When you focus on those practical issues and indeed on sex education, okay, we want children to get good, appropriate information, but we don't want adults being naked in front of them at the age of five. So when you focus on the detail, actually the, the mainstream approach is not very popular. So the best thing we can do is get everything out into the light and never letting up. We have the right as a society, as parents, as teachers, to be clear, if you think something is worth doing, be honest about it. Be open about it. So my message, I suppose, to, to, to you is two, two things. First of all, don't be afraid of the evidence. 
Because it, and the evidence won't always support, you know, with, oh, it's a bit of a, that study found this, that doesn't quite fit in with my view. It's not, that's not, not the point. We'd be frank and honest about the evidence, whether it's in our favour or, or not, whatever it might be. Of course, what really matters is right and wrong. So the evidence doesn't tell you what you should do. It, it, it helps to inform the context of what you should be doing. And there you've got to go back to your own values and ethics and rights. And of course, that's the most important thing. So don't let the evidence drive what's going on, but don't be frightened of the evidence either. Okay? So have heart, and above all, the second message I want to say is that everybody who's working in this and sometimes getting a hard time, because you can get a hard time in this area, thank you so much for everything you do, whether it's as a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, a social worker, whatever area you're in, thank you very much. Thank you.